everyone. And thank you, Pam and the singers. That was lovely. We appreciate that. And uh, the uh, interesting thing is, you know, I was, I was looking at my calendar, and I understand there's an election this coming Tuesday. Uh, you know, somebody told me something about that. Well, I put it on the agenda, and I felt that we're going to kick up a tradition once again at Bonanza that was actually done in American churches for better than 200 years. It's only been in the last, uh, you know, 60, 50, 60 years, and it's sort of fallen out of favor. And uh, that is the idea of an election day sermon. And uh, it was done. And uh, it's interesting. Let me ask you a question, maybe a little trivia question here. Uh, does anybody know the name of the last and only president that we've ever had in our nation that was an ordained and active Methodist minister? Now there's a piece of trivia for you. He was the 20th president of the United States. And his name was James A. Garfield. He followed a, a, another famous president by the name of Rutherford Buford Hayes and was succeeded by a fellow named Chester Allen Arthur. Now all of those people I'm sure you have on, your, on the tip of your tongues, but he was the 20th president. He actually was a major general in the Civil War and fought for the Union. But through all of that, he ha was actually a Methodist minister. And as a member of Congress, he actually had a circuit that he rode. And on Sundays, he went to churches around the area, Virginia area, and preached. Different ones. Now, when was the last time we had a president do something like that? He also, in his inauguration, did something that no one has ever done before or after. And during his inauguration, you know they always have people, various representatives, pray. Garfield was a president that bowed his head and led the nation in prayer. Wouldn't it be something to have a president like that? The sad story is they killed him. He was the first president assassinated after J Abraham Lincoln. He, he served eight months and was killed by a disgruntled office seeker. So, now you know the rest of the story. But what a difference between that and what we hear today, isn't it? What a difference. I just want to say this morning that some of the things I'm saying, I don't know if it'll bother you or not, but I want you to really work hard, some of you to listen to what my whole thing is going to be. Because what I say at the first may seem like I'm making light of what, not, not light in the sense of ha-ha, but light in the sense of I'm not taking it seriously, you know, what's going to be happening on Tuesday. I want to say that, and by the way, the reason we do it down here as opposed to up there is this is a talk from the table. Uh, I, we didn't want to bring the table out, and normally you'd sit behind the table and, and do a talk. But it's just a, a talk with us folks. We sang some songs this morning, read a song. And these songs directed us to the sovereignty of God and to how He works in the world and in our nation. And I want to tell you, I want to say to you folks, and this is what I mean by some might think I'm taking it too lightly, don't overestimate the importance of this coming election in the big scheme of things. Don't overestimate it. As far as God's concerned, from eternity past to eternity future, it's fairly insignificant what's going to happen. God is in control. And he's in control of everything. 
Presidents, in one sense, don't really matter. Because the kingdom of darkness is the kingdom of darkness. We should expect it to conduct itself the way it does. Nations don't matter. Presidents go and presidents come. Nations go and nations come. And they're all in a temporal cycle throughout human history. And you know what? Ultimately, they will all pass away. So in that context, I'm saying that what's going to happen doesn't have eternal significance. What happens in America has no relation to the kingdom of God. What happens in American politics, the election, it has no bearing on God. It doesn't harm his kingdom. It doesn't help his kingdom. Why? The kingdom of God is a different dimension. Jesus said, my kingdom is not of this world. My kingdom is not of this world. And the election that we're going to face is just another event in the kingdom of darkness. That's what it is. And as the world cycles through its history, <laughs> we'll see what happens. You know what matters? Christians matter. People of faith matter. Men and women who are preparing to serve God in, in, in ministry matter. More than any president. Because they are the ones that are bringing the message to the world. Along with all other countries, I want you to think about this, all other countries, America is like the Titanic. And it's a ship that's going down. And the politicians are like the crew. And you know what the crew is doing? When the ship is going down, they're rearranging the deck chairs. That's what's happening. That's what's really happening. But our responsibility is not to get caught up in the rearrangement of the deck chairs. Our responsibility is to provide the lifeboat of the gospel. Amen. And that's what we're here for, to rescue souls that would be otherwise condemned. That's who we are. And we must never forget that. As Garfield of old, and if you read some of his letters and some of his interviews, as I have, because he's quite a unique fellow. Although he rose to the highest office in the land, he never considered it to be his defining thing. He was a minister of the gospel. That's what defined him. He was a minister of the gospel who was bivocational, who happened to make his living as a member of Congress and ultimately as the President of the United States. But he never ceased to be a minister of the gospel. So how's a Christian supposed to approach this matter of voting? <laughs> Am I to understand that God would have me have a role to play? Well, first, we don't revolt. We don't rebel. We live quiet, peaceful lives in all godliness and dignity. And yes, we pay our taxes. 
That's exactly what Scripture says. It says we submit to those who are over us. We submit to them and we pray for their salvation. But we also understand that God has designed human government. You want to turn to Romans 13. Romans 13, 1 to 7. Here's what it says. It says, Let every soul be subject to the governing authorities, for there is no authority except from God, and the authorities that exist are appointed by God. Therefore, whoever resists the authority resists the ordinance of God. And those who resist will bring judgment on themselves. For rulers, now get this, rulers are not a terror to good works, but to evil. Do you want to be unafraid of the authority? Do what is good, and you will have praise from the same. For he is God's minister to you for good. But if you do evil, be afraid, for he does not bear the sword in vain. For he is God's minister, an avenger, to execute wrath on him who practices evil. Therefore you must be subject not because of the wrath, but also for conscience sake. In other words, submit, do what's right, not because you're afraid somebody's going to thump you, but because it's the right thing to do. Not because what you might get out of it, but because it's the right thing to do. For they are God's ministers, attending continually to this very thing. Render therefore to all their due. Taxes to whom taxes are due, customs to whom customs, fear to whom he fear, honor to whom honor is due. Now this passage tells us how God has designed human government. And as I look at the passage, it tells me that there are two things that government is ultimately for. Two purposes. Two purposes. To protect those who do good and to punish those who do evil. Anything beyond that is invented by men. The role of government, I say it again, is to punish those who do evil so you can have an order in a civilization and culture. So you really have one question to ask. And realize, when we're talking about what's going to happen on Tuesday, and realize, and this is something that when I came and I settled it in my own heart several years ago, when I go to that ballot box, or mail it in, or, or take the computer card and go punch, 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 depending on where you're at, I'm not voting for a man. What I am voting for, and I want you to think about this, you're voting for a coalition. You're voting for a coalition. The person at the head of the coalition, running for president, is simply the public relations agent for the coalition behind him or her. That's what's going on. That's what's actually happening. So the question becomes, which coalition of leaders and influencers as a whole will best uphold God's design for government? Something else we need to remember in human history. Most people don't even make that choice. Our brothers and sisters in China today they don't get to make that choice that we do. Brothers and sisters in the Middle East, they don't get to make that choice. It's not an option for them. They don't have election day sermons because they don't have elections. They get what they get. Just like Paul, who wrote Romans 13, he got. don't get to do that. We must remember, you know, government is designed to protect those who do good and make people safe and to punish those that do evil. 
And let me say this with all conviction. No Biblicist Christian can vote for a coalition, an earthly, powerful, social, political machine that reverses God's order and sets out to punish those who do good and protect those that do evil. Can't do it. Shouldn't do it. Look at what's condemned. I'm not going to refer to I'll refer to it. Open your Bibles, take a quick glance while I'm talking at Romans 1.18 through 2.26. Romans 1.18 to 2.26. And scan that. And then look at the Democrat Party. Their platform embraces what Romans 118 to 226 flat condemns. When you see that, it's pretty clear who to vote for. Tragically, and up until the last 15 years, I was a lifelong Democrat. I'll be plain to say it. My parents were Democrats. My grandparents were Democrats. As he used to say, we were yellow dog Democrats. You know what that is? What a yellow dog Democrat is? It didn't matter if the Democrats put up a dumb old yellow dog for the office. We'd vote for them. the trend of the Democrat Party is reversing the direction of God's design for government. God's design for government is that it should embrace that which is good and protect life. However, in America, 70 million babies have been killed in a mother's womb. Now part of the platform is to extend that to the last trimester and abort babies on the very hour of their birth. That is not protecting life. That is not protecting the goodness of motherhood. That is destructive. And to allow for that, and to allow people to protect those who do evil, is not right. And then there's the issue of marriage. God designed marriage to only be between a man and a woman for life. Any worldview that attacks that definition and seeks to normalize alternative lifestyles, that seeks to protect that thinking and punish people who speak out against such behavior, has reversed God's design for government. Oh, and by the way, no Biblicist Christian should vote for a, a coalition of people who think that people who murder are to be protected and to think people who utterly destroy marriage and the family ought to be protected and speak against those who want to protect them and work to punish them. No Biblicist co Christian can vote for a coalition that believes that we have to take children and make sure that they have the freedom to deny their physical creation as male and female, which is a massive assault on children since people caught up in the transgender lie tragically take are 19 times more likely to kill themselves than the rest of the population. According to the Indian Journal of Psychological Medicine, November and December 2016, and I quote, the suicide attempt rate among transgender persons ranges from 32 to 50 percent across the countries. Now that's just a, the way the Indian folk would, meaning around the world. 
to protect that kind of thinking engenders and systematizes confusion and it is to rob our children and grandchildren of their innocence. And it is to protect the destruction of life rather than to protect life itself. Another function of government is to carry the sword, which Romans talks about. It's the most extreme threat, even that of capital punishment. And it's a threat to maintain law and order. So ask yourself, and ask yourself, look at, ask yourself, is, a, is it a biblical Christian thing to vote for a coalition that would systematically weaken our military? For the protection of its people? Or would systematically weaken the police so that we're both vulnerable externally and internally? Can a biblicist Christian vote for a coalition of people that give license to rioting and destruction? Can we vote for a coalition of people who will put judges into place who will turn good and evil on its head? Can we defend a coalition of leaders in this country who prefer paganism to biblical Christianity? We want to give no, who want to give no place for biblical truth, who have rejected the Bible, mocked the Bible, and begun what I would call soft persecution of Christians. Now I have no desire or warrant in this age, the church age, to hurt or persecute such people who advocate for this sort of thing. I just don't want to make decisions. I just don't want to make decisions. Biblical, biblicist Christians can't vote for the things we have to stand against. And we're able to do that in one simple way. You vote for the other coalition. Now, I'm not endorsing a particular candidate. Frankly, some of the candidates, and I'll be plain to say it, of the alternative coalition, the Republican Party, I would not want my, near my daughters unchaperoned. And I'll be plain to say it. And that goes from the president on down. But in the final analysis, elections are not about individual candidates. Many of whom on both sides leave much to be desired. What then is an election about? It's about advocacy. It's about advocacy. The policies that they will enact. And anyone saying, and I would hope you'd say it with me, as long as I'm in this world and as long as I have the opportunity, I'm going to stand with God. I'm going to stand against those things that strike a blow to His design for government. And in so doing, we can maybe slow down this Titanic sinking just a little bit. We're not going to turn it around, I don't think. Call me a pessimist. Normally I'm a real optimist, but when it comes to this, I'm a pessimist. We're already, I believe, under the judgment of God. We've seen the sexual revolution in Romans 1. We've seen the homosexual revolution, Romans 1. Now we have reprobate minds thinking and making policy in our nation. And our nation is so confused that we don't even acknowledge what's male and female. I don't mind spiritual persecution. That comes with the territory. But I would expect, you know, I would not expect to have organized governmental assaults on the Bible and the church and the proclamation of the gospel. The family protection of the innocence, law and order, and I in my little small way can stand with what God clearly says in Scripture.
by marking a ballot or punching out a chad. Remember those chads from a few years ago? I need to, when, whenever I am, wherever I can, I need to punch a hole. I need to do that. In the words of Joshua, Joshua 24, 15, and he's writing to people, but if serving the Lord seems undesirable to you, then choose for yourself this day who you will serve, whether the gods of your ancestors that they served beyond the Euphrates, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you are living. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. I want to say something else, however. We don't know the outcome of the election. I, for one, am not that prescient. I don't have the ability to see the future, unlike the Lord. The only time I see the future is when I don't take the trash out. Because I know what my wife will do. See, <laughs> when that happens. We don't know the outcome of an election. And you know what? We know very few politicians. You know, we know Dennis Lithicum, our brother and friend. Werner Reschke. We know these people. We have contact every day, however, with friends and neighbors and business associates and people we meet on, these, on the street. And you know what? Many of these folks would loudly advocate for everything that I have spoken against this morning. They would. And win or lose the election, I want to remind you of something. Any of you that think of yourself as a Biblicist Christian, these other folks are not our enemy. They are not our enemy. You know who they are? You know who they are? They are our mission field. And we must never forget that. For that is the role why we are here. Remember what we said about the lifeboat of the gospel. Never forget that. They are folks who are in the kingdom of darkness. And never forget that you and I were redeemed out of that very kingdom. It was God's effectual call that drew us to Him. When He, by the power of His Spirit, witnessed with our spirit and said, Let there be light. That's who we are. And He opened it up in our darkened hearts. 1 Corinthians 6, 9-11 says the following, Or do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived. The sexually immortal, immoral, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor men who practice homosexuality, nor thieves, nor greedy, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. And most of us would say, Yeah! But the verse goes on, it says, And such were some of you. But you were washed, and you were sanctified, and you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and by the Spirit of God. That is our mission. That's why we're here. So let us respect our leaders. Let us pray for our leaders. Let us pray for their salvation. Remember that Paul wrote Romans 13 at a very difficult time. You know who the emperor was when Paul wrote that? Huh? Somebody said it. Nero. Nero was the absolute butcher of Christians. He 
He was so vile that if you wanted to walk up to his palace at night, you could and you could do it lit. By the bodies of Christians who were on crosses on fire. And yet Paul says, pray for his salvation. Live quiet and peaceable lives. So understand the context. For Paul, those words were not simple <laughs> uh, academic words. That was real, rough life. And for the people in that age. We're, Oh, it's underneath. Okay. Sorry about that. All right. Very good. We're almost done anyway. Okay. We're going to be facing some interesting days in the future. And I, for one, am excited to see what the Lord will do protecting us from or taking us through the difficulties. And having said all that, don't overestimate the significance of this election. Folks, be happy. Be joyful. Be thankful. Husbands, love your wives. Rejoice with them. Love your kids. Love your grandchildren. Those are the things that you possess that you have eternal value with. Those are the things that can go to heaven with you. They can take my possessions. Embrace those things that have eternal value. And enjoy the wonderful grace that God has given us. And on election day, if we don't win, you can walk around sullen a little bit. We'll give you to the end of the day. But just like the Bible says, don't let the sun set on your wrath. Don't let it set on your sullenness. Remember who's in control. And whatever happens doesn't matter. God has not lost, will not have lost anything. He is still in control. Philippians 4, 4 to 7 says, and with this I close, Rejoice in the Lord always. And again, I say rejoice. Let your gentleness be known to all men. The Lord is at hand. Be anxious for nothing. Be anxious for nothing, but in everything, by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. And the peace of God that passes all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds through Christ Jesus. That's all I have to say. That's all I have to say. The We're going to do something a little different. We're now going to have a time of prayer. And any who would wish to pray, please do so. Following the time of prayer, we'll gather around the table, so to speak. We'll pass the elements to you. We want this to be a special time. It's true that in the kingdom of God, the election really has no bearing. But in our lives, it does. And it is appropriate to ask God for wisdom and protection. And to move in the hearts of leaders and people. So join with me, if you will, and pray, just like we did before. If you led, pray out loud. It wouldn't... We can spend quite a bit of time if we need to. But if not, we won't tarry. We want to give you that opportunity. Let's pray. For our